Do you see any resemblance to me to this picture? Or to this young man, Vincent, to this picture? Or to Ellen White? There's no resemblance in all. I keep telling these young people that these big sports teams have lost something. When my culture, when my spirituality, when my tradition that I attempt to practice is taken into sport entertainment, it offends me. To reduce the victims of genocide to a stereotype symbol or mascot is immoral, and it is unkind, and it is no honor. The decision to ban Native American nicknames was easily the most polarizing decision I've ever made. When Native Americans say, we don't like it, we think it denigrates our religion and our culture, <laughs> please stop. Why shouldn't they stop? We're asking, where is the honor? We've asked you here today to participate in this very important forum, and we want to thank all of you very heartily for being here. It seems that you have to put another race or religion in place of the Indian for people to understand this issue. Let me give you a quick example. I was talking to a public official in Bloomington, and he was very unhappy with me because I was working on this issue. I knew he was Catholic, and I didn't know it at the time, but I did pull a Clyde Belcourt. I said, what if this team was named the Catholics? What if they dragged a crucifix around the stadium what if they had cheerleaders dressed like the Virgin Mary and they were wafting incense into the stands? And, I, and then I said, you know, we're using sacred symbols of American Indian people. And you know what? It was like a light bulb went on. He understood immediately. But back to the point, I find it interesting that you have to do that kind of juxtaposition before people understand how Indian people feel about this. By distorting and by bastardizing sacred symbols, we cut at the very soul of a people. We can do better in our country. We can focus on the vision of a proud and dignified people, a people with rich traditions, and we can honor that vision by respecting its symbols. We can respect, we can as a nation and as a country respect these symbols because we know what bastardizing them does to children and the vision of themselves when children have symbols that make them proud and give them dignity and know that they can live lives with honor, then that's what they do. And when the symbols undercut that hope, and that vision and that strength in children, that is a cruel thing to do. It is the wrong thing to do, and that's why we have this conference here today. the only American ever to win a gold medal in the Olympic 10,000-meter run. Anytime there's change, we need to feel less threatened. We feel the repercussion of a university that's threatened when we address the mascot issue. In the last month, I've been fingered. I've been spit upon. I've been called a pathetic loser simply because I presented change to people. 
And the only words I chose to use was, when my culture, when my spirituality, when my tradition that I attempt to practice is taken into sport entertainment, it offends me. What in that comment deserves to be spit upon, to be fingered, to be called a pathetic loser, or to be called prairie nigger? The world is changing. We live in strange times. How do we address the change? We need to develop young leadership that's responsible, young leadership that's accountable, and young leadership that is given an infrastructure to implement what I call intelligent and adaptive programs of change. I want to share with you very quickly a way in which I think we can and we are addressing change. I want to give you one example of how it helped me. 1992, Barcelona, Spain. And I want to give this example because the greatest challenge we face in a changing world is ignorance, as Charlene mentioned, and the perceptions that ignorance perpetuates. Barcelona, Spain, 1992. Five minutes before the 10,000 meter run, I was given four and a half minutes of worldwide coverage. One billion people saw this program on Billy. They talked about the $28 million I helped raise for charities worldwide that year. Then I'm introduced. The 10,000 meter races run. Ska from Morocco beats Chalimo, the young 19-year-old Kenyan. One o'clock in the morning, my wife, daughter, and I, we sit down for dinner on the Rombolis. The US media sat behind us. They begin to communicate. The 10,000 meter run this evening between Ska and Chalimo has to be the greatest race in the history of the Olympic Games. Another US media said, no, 1964 when that Indian guy won. <laughs> Vernon, we've never had a name. Perceptions, we've never had a name. The Indian guy, that's still the greatest race in the history of the games. Another man said, no. 1964, that was the greatest upset. This was the greatest race. And they debate. Another man said, I wonder whatever happened to that Indian guy. Now my daughter, Billy Joe, she said, Daddy, I think they're talking about you. <laughs> and I go, shh. They continued, yeah, 1964. That's, that's still the greatest race. Yeah, I agree, the greatest race, the greatest upset. Whatever happened to that Indian guy? As my daughter, Billy Joe, started to say, Daddy, tell them who you are. Another US media spoke and said, I'll tell you what happened to that Indian guy. He's like all the rest of them. Like all Indian people in America. He might have won a race, but when it comes to life, they're quitters. He's alcoholic. He's drug addicted. That's the way they all are. My daughter, who has never seen alcohol, crossed my lips. She knows I've never taken drugs. She said, Daddy, say something. I couldn't speak. Then she stroked my shoulder. She said, Daddy, you're my hero. Please say something. I still could not speak. Then she stroked my arm, kissed me on the cheek, and she said, Daddy, say something. You always seem to have wings of an eagle. <laughs> Boom! I spoke. I addressed the issue. The media said, Billy, we'll become the biggest advocates for the youth of America, primarily the Native American youth. They disappeared. My daughter, no longer the bodybuilder, but if she's in her mother's womb, stroked me again, kissed me on the cheek, just kept stroking my arm and my shoulder saying, Daddy, I knew you would have the wings of an eagle. America is a country that no longer talks to one another. America entertains each other. And they entertain with mascots. My dad said, son, look inside of your body, your mind, and your soul. And I'll tell you what you're going to find, because I found it. 
You're going to find a lot of hate. You're going to find a lot of anger. You're going to find a lot of hurt and a lot of self-pity. All of those things will destroy you, son. Look deeper. And if you look deeper, you're going to find the truth. You're going to find dignity. You're going to find character. You're going to find a positive desire, a passion that will empower you and empower humankind. All those other things I described will destroy you. Look deeper, son. Find the passion. Find the positive desire. We need to look inside of each other. We need to help one another find positive desires for the betterment of humankind. Imagery is something that all of us have of each other. But we need to build respectful images. We don't need Bucktooth Indians on the Cleveland Indian mascot. We don't need names like Washington Redskins anymore. We have to move forward into the next millennium with the idea of respect for all people, not only in America, but throughout the world. Is leadership simply checking with everyone in your constituency and finding out what they want to do, what is okay with them, and then simply leading in that direction? Or is it to find in one's own heart and, and intellect uh, a true path and then lead others who may not be so inclined in that direction? Well, I think he, he fits the bill of leadership in that second category, which I believe is the true nature of leadership. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you the senior vice president and editor of the Minneapolis Star Tribune, the president of the American Society of Newspaper Editors, one of our community's leaders. Ladies and gentlemen, Tim McGuire. The clincher in the decision-making process was an odd discovery that during the Twins Atlanta World Series in 1991, our page one writer, Howard Sinker, wrote every page one story on that series without ever mentioning the word Braves. And no one noticed. <laughs> Editors at the Star Tribune didn't notice. Readers didn't notice. The Native American community didn't notice. That discovery convinced me, obviously wrongly, that the move to ban these nicknames just wouldn't be that big a deal. In truth, there was another huge issue at play. I didn't talk about it much then, and I'm still a bit reluctant to talk about it now, though in recent years I've come out of the closet, so to speak. This decision came right about the time I was starting to try to understand how my religious and spiritual life should mesh with my work life. Earlier in 1993, I'd had a major epiphany with a workplace consultant in which I came to the conclusion I could no longer separate my spiritual life from my work life. A key part of that spiritual inquiry was an increased focus on the concept of the second great commandment. In the Christian tradition, the first great commandment is love God. The second great commandment is love your neighbor as you love yourself. I understood well the concept of the second great commandment, but what did it really mean for a newspaper editor whose publication makes people sad, mad, and glad every day. It seemed to me that it clearly meant that I ought to deeply consider that if these nicknames were offending a certain and important part of my audience, then I needed to get rid of those names. It seemed like a basic, humane gesture to my fellow man. Putting together these remarks has allowed me to contemplate 
and reconsider a decision I've attempted to cast aside because it hurt so much. The ridicule did hurt. The complete lack of followers did hurt. The fact that the will of so many Native Americans has so callously been ignored has hurt. In my 30 years in this business, I've had a lot of hurts and I've had a lot of successes. Today's reflection leaves me convinced that at least on January 25th, 1994, Tim McGuire did the right thing. That's one for the success column. The logo has nothing to do with, you know, disrespect to the American Indians. I don't understand it. They should be happy. I mean, we're winning. Going to the University of Illinois, a Big Ten university, was a dream come true. I was the first generation to go. And the two, the two other folks that were um, recruited along with me, uh, Norman Akers and Marcus Ammerman and myself, all first generation Native people to go to get an advanced degree. It was a dream come true that very quickly turned into a nightmare because the university used as its athletic identity an Indian mascot. And who would think to ask that question as you're looking for a university? Who would think that that's an important question to ask? Because universities should be an environment where all people's background and religion is respected. And what we found was anything but honor and respect. When we got to that campus, we walked around, and of course, like any people, we look for our community. We look for people who are like us. And we're walking around this Big Ten University with its Greek pillars and its Ivy League buildings. And we asked the questions, where are the other Native students on this campus? Is there a Native Studies program? Is there a Native faculty member? Is there a Native center that helps counsel and, and retain Native students? The answer to those questions was no. We soon realized that we were the Native community on this campus of 36,000 students who used as their athletic identity an Indian mascot. And of course, the other thing that happens on a campus, on any campus, is that the first few weeks that you're there, they're introducing you to all of the school traditions. So you learn the fight song. You might learn the colors. You might learn all of the traditions that go with becoming part of a university um, community. And of course, because they had this Indian identity as their you know, athletic identity, um, all of their activities, their songs, um, had some kind of variation of Indian themes. And because there was no Native community to challenge the stereotypes that were so prevalent within the community, it was, it was very hard. We saw some very um, awful things uh, that we've seen, of course, across the country. I'm going to show you some examples. But on this campus, some of the sororities and fraternities would have Indian caricatures on their posters to advertise whatever event was happening. There was buck and squaw dances. There was a sorority that had the Miss Illini Squaw Contest. And of course, a, um, squaw is the most derogatory term you could refer to a Native woman. Its race-neutral term is whore. And it's actually much more crass and offensive than that. But it's very specifically directed at Native people when you use the word squaw. There was a bar that had a fallen down neon sign of an Indian person falling down over and over again. It was called Home of the Drinking Illini that had this caricature of this dumb Indian, big belly, big nose, buck teeth, crooked feather, crosses in his eyes, falling down over and over again. And so being in this environment became incredibly harmful and hurtful to us, especially when you're three students on a campus of 36,000 students, what do you possibly do? 
we did not feel welcome and we did not feel safe in this environment. Our universities and schools owe all their students a safe environment without the distraction, without the additional burden of bigotry. To many of the proponents of these symbols will agree and feel perfectly comfortable telling everyone that this is what we think of as Indian. They will even tell us with these caricatures that it's honorable to our face. And I tell them, don't insult my intelligence by telling me these honor our people. My family is honorable. The people in this room are honorable. These are not. It has nothing to do with who we are as Indian people, as indigenous people. And it has everything to do with playing Indian. It has everything to do with stereotypes. And we shouldn't confuse this. Stereotypes dehumanize, period, for those people who do not understand this. We ask of you today to get these things out of our way, not just out of the way of Native people, but non-Native people. Remove these racist shackles and lodestones that we did not ask for. Remove them. Get them out of our way. We did not devise these things. Get them out of our way, and we will show you who we are. You see, we've been here before. We've been here time and time again. Every opportunity we get to speak to a group, we're here. Because it's very hard for us to be hurt in this country. I'm sorry. Because we are tokens in our own homeland. And it's very hard for us to be hurt. But we have many people on the front lines out there. We have been here, and we'll continue to come back over and over again, speaking into the same empty, non-responsive hole in the hearts of these people who refuse to hear us. We are saying the same thing. We said it to Columbus. We said it to Andrew Jackson. We said it to Teddy Roosevelt. We said it to Custer. And now we say it to you. And you see, it's very simple. We are human. We are human. Why is it so difficult for Americans to understand the depth of the offensiveness of American Indian mascots and the use of names such as Redskins and Braves? It is difficult because many Americans do not know much at all about American Indian culture. Many people have grown up seeing trivializing images of indigenous culture and view them as common and harmless entertainment. Out of that ignorance comes the lack of understanding of the importance of this issue. Many schools and organizations refuse to change because they do not view the issue as offensive or important. They have nostalgia for their mascot or team, name. Community members, alumni, and board directors connect the image with the good old days of their college experience. There is nothing wrong with the nostalgia and wanting to remember good times, but American Indian symbols should not have been used in the first place. It is time to find other symbols and have good times with them. Change is long overdue, and change is possible. The solution is to bring awareness and understanding to the use of American Indian names, logos, and mascots as identities for sports teams, and to gain commitment from the members of the media to discontinue this activity. The American Indian Forum on Racism in Sports and Media will provide an opportunity 
for decision makers in the media across Minnesota, and we hope throughout the country, to gain awareness and understanding of this issue and bring about the commitment of the media to end the use of American Indian mascots, logos, and names. 